It is a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the man himself, Ben, ben Sutter. Dr. Sutter received a BA in psychology as well as a BS in biology from the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. He then earned his DMD from the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey, now known as Rutgers School of Dental Medicine, where he was the recipient of numerous academic awards. While in New Jersey, he completed a one-year hospital-based residency at Overlook Hospital in Summit. Dr. Sutter is also the author of articles and abstracts of his vast clinical research and teaching experience. He has been studying and treating TMJ dysfunction since going into private practice in 2008. In that time, Dr. Sutter has sought advanced education and training in treating neuromuscular issues. His studies have taken him to the Las Vegas Institute and the Piper Education and Research Center. He has attended equilibration seminars as well as aesthetic masters. Dr. Sutter is also a certified perfect bite doctor, which was the precursor to the true dentist system of diagnosis and therapy methodologies. When you see Dr. Sutter for treatment of TMD, TMD, you can expect thorough care that targets your specific needs. Hey, Ben, I called you for this. You did not call me. And I wanted to talk to you because this is um, dentistry uncensored. And you have to admit, of everything we do in dentistry, TMD, TMJ is the most controversial. I mean, I, I mean I'm just following the message boards on Dental Town. It's hard to get two dentists to agree that today is Friday. But can you get any of them to agree on occlusion? And, and, and how did you get into this? And do you, do you personally find it academically um, controversial amongst your two million dentists around the world? Well, okay, a lot of questions there. So, and I agree <laughs> with you that it's hard to get two dentists to agree on, on uh, what day of the week it is. Um, you know, when we were in dental school, uh, and we were learning to read radiographs, our, our dentists would say, or our mentors would say, if you show your x-rays to 10 different dentists, you're going to get 10 different treatment plans. And we laugh and chuckle about that, but in the world of occlusion and TMD, it's, it's really, unfortunately, it's the truth. The profession has no sense of self where occlusion is concerned. You know, if there was one truth, there would be only one answer. And so I think the reality is when you learn some of these different systems as far as, uh, you know, LBI or course or spear or Tudenta or whatever, all of these work um, some of the time. None of them work all of the time. And if you spend time on any message board, whether it's Facebook, Dental Town or whatever, you get a sense of that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what the answer is as far as <clears throat> us as a profession and two million dentists coming to an agreement. Um, you know, I think for me, being able to measure something and getting a repeatable response from patients and and being able to quantitate that and put numbers to it, which is the reason why I incorporated some technology into my office, uh, like EMGs. Uh, uh, joint vibration analysis, computerized jaw tracking, um, T-scan, T-scan land with EMGs. So you're able to see what's going on with the musculature in the face in real time with what's going on in the bite. And I think a lot of us uh, don't incorporate that because some very important people in our world and our profession have said, yeah, these are really just gadgets. I don't find that personally well i want to you know you're 45 i'm 53 most of our listeners are under 30 you know every time i get an email it's you know they're usually been out of school two three four years i just want to remind them that when these uh kids were uh probably in uh, the first grade there was a that you remember there was a reader's digest article where you know reader's digest was on every um house front room when i was growing up as a child all my grandmas aunts uncles and this i think his name was ekberg uh took a full set of x-rays and study models and he literally went to 30 different dentists and got 30 different treatment plans from do nothing to all the way to thirty thousand, 
And it was just the perfect line in between. So when we say that, we're not saying it tongue in cheek. We're not saying this funny, but the bottom line is dentistry is an art and a science. And I'm sure a thousand years from now, this might be black and white, but we're going to live and practice in our whole lifetime and not know the answers to a lot of these problems our patients have. Correct? I would agree with that. Um, I would agree with that with, with the caveat that um, when you measure your repeatability and your success rates go up and uh, you mentioned TMD. So if you're going to treat TMD and you're looking at, Hey, I'm going to send my, uh, my bite registration and my, my models off to the lab and I'm going to have a splint made and I'm going to, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start to adjust my, the bite on this thing and get, try to get my patient feeling better. You know, you have to, you have to understand that we, we are limited in the ability just to, just to mount models. And what I mean by that is there was a study, a guy, a guy was doing his, uh, I think it was a master's or a PhD graduate level. And he was a dentist. Um, used uh, T-scan to measure uh, his own mouth on multiple articulators and just measuring the bite on these articulators. He used a, the same weight and the same calibrated um, um, articulator and his error, his, his, his incidence of error was between 1% and 13%. Now, if you're building a bite, and your first step is to mount the model and you introduce one to 13% as a dentist, you're doing this. If that's the first step, that error is going to be magnified going forward. And so what's unique about DTR and what, and, and what I'm doing and, and is it's all measured, measured into the mouth. So there's no error from transferring from models to the patient. It's all measured into the patient, and it's repeatable. Okay, so well, let, let's start at the beginning. Let's, why did you get interested in TMD? Well, <laughs> what what went wrong in your life where you decided you wanted to focus <laughs> in TMD? <laughs> you know, was it early childhood trauma or what? What happened to yeah, you? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you got I lost. Got dropped on my head um, <laughs> as an infant, but. Um, you know, it seemed like I was seeing a lot of these patients had headaches and jaw pain and sensitive teeth. And um, I started doing some, just reading some literature and it, it, uh, the literature was anywhere from 35 to 20% of the population is untreated TMD. And so- what percent? Uh, anywhere from like 20 to 35, 30, 30, 33% have TMD, have untreated TMD. Now they may have, <clears throat> they may have signs like, you know, uh, occlusal facets, uh, chipping, um, and not, not, not really all of the symptoms, headache, ringing in the ears, sore neck, so, uh, uh, sore back of the, uh, back of the head, sensitive hair facial tension, facial pain. Um, but I started reading this and decided, you know what, if there's 30% of my practice, you don't even have to advertise. Just start, you know, looking a little bit more closely, build up some diagnostic skills, ask the, the right questions. And all of a sudden you start hearing a pattern over and over and over in these patients that are complaining of these symptoms or have these wear facets. So at the end of the day, it's the patient's option whether they want to do anything about it or not. But, you know, a very wise man once told me, the more I know, the less normal my patients look. And nowhere is that really relevant more than the TMD world. Well, I find it interesting, Ben, that you have a, um, your undergraduate degree was, uh, you had a degree in psychology along with biology. How much of this TMD is mental stress? You know, two parts to that question, or two parts to the answer. One would be, I think stress absolutely exacerbates 
TMD symptomology. And there was a, uh, an article that was published in Jada Magazine. It was probably about three or four years ago, but I think it was, on, it was the cover article. And it was an interesting study, and they had done brain scans on people who had chronic pain of TMD, and they wanted to compare it and say, okay, now let's look at people who are asymptomatic, in other words, they don't have chronic pain, and compare these brain scans. And what they found was the brain scans were the most similar to people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So I think people that are in chronic pain definitely have um, an underlying stress or mental, there's, there's brain chemistry that has actually changed, okay? So you see that in the images. When you get out of pain, brain chemistry is restored and some of these depression and anxiety improves. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an astute, very conscientious TMD doc and functional doc, but I'm, my results aren't 100%. Um, and I wouldn't say that the, the patients that do feel better would come back to me and say, wow, you know what? I have a stress-free life now, you know? my." my the dog's not barking all night long. My, my husband doesn't nag or my, my wife doesn't tell me to take out the trash or the, my boss isn't, you know, on my backside chewing me out about this or that. I don't change any of those things. What we're really looking at is a physiologic change in how the stomatonathic system works. And when you relieve the pain, some of these things that I think have been coupled with TMD tend to improve. Okay, Ben, it's my job to guesstimate the questions. These, uh, these thousands of dentists listening to this are all by themselves. They're commuting to work. You're, uh, what is DTR? You know, they know TMD, temporomandibular disorder. But you say occlusion, TMD, and DTR. What is DTR? DTR stands for disclusion time reduction. So disclusion is how the teeth come apart, measured in time, Reduction is, is we want to measure the time that, um, that that takes place. In other words, the more tooth-on-tooth -tooth friction you have when you go into right or left lateral excursive movements, the, the more time that takes, the more muscles have to work to avoid working and non-working interferences. And so by reducing that time and making the bite more efficient, um, you're, you're, you're changing uh, clenchability of the teeth. You're changing how, how muscles work. And uh, I'm probably one of the few guys who, on a consistent basis, I, take a, I have a protocol where I measure um, before and after that therapy. So specifically, we look at the muscles. We look at clenchability. Um, are you able to recruit more muscle? Are you able to open wider? Uh, I find that... Um, you know, the first first round of DTR, patients open wider. There you go. You don't even need it. <laughs> but um, uh, in essence, DTR is uh, an occlusal therapy. So all the doctors that are, that are listening to this that are believe that it's solely a joint position or it is, hey, I've just got to separate the teeth with a splint and symptoms will go down, and that is true. Uh, that will happen. Uh, but I have many patients that come to me with uh, hand, handfuls of splints. And so it's interesting with T-Scan, which is an occlusal digital analyzer, I just start popping these into patients and say, okay, bite on the, bite on the, um, on the sensor, and let's see where your bite is. <clears throat> and these bites are all over the place. So you might come in and a patient who is, 60% on the left and 40% on the right, you know, you, you don't have to be a dentist to understand that that's not good. Uh, if you dumb it down even further and I say get two, two scales that you would measure your weight loss on, and I say, okay, now divide your, divide your weight by 60-40 and put 60% of your weight on the right leg and 40% of your weight on the, on the left, how long could you stand there? before your knees, your lower back, uh, 
parts of your body would start to ache and hurt. And these patients that have this bite distribution going on, they never get a break. The teeth are the hardest substance in the body. And that's what's really the dominant force in this. The joints and the muscles try to accommodate, but um, that's where your pain is coming from. So <clears throat> how would you describe how, let's just focus on just America. Sure. How do you feel the average 150,000 dentists treat TMD versus how do you treat TMD? And, and what, 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 do you, what do you think, what, what kind of grade would you give the 150,000 average dentist, how they treat TMD, how do they treat TMD, and how do you do it differently? Well, let's, let's back up and not even make it about other dentists, because I can't speak intelligently on what other dentists do in their office. But let's go back to dental school. Is anybody listening to this thinking that, man, I really got a good education in oral facial pain and occlusion? The reality is no, none of us do. I mean, I hear it when I lecture and just going to lunch with the, uh, the specialists around my time, my, around my town. They're like, no, we really didn't learn. It's occlusion is freshman year right next to dental anatomy. Okay, well, maybe that's occlusion one, but in senior year, before you go out and start treating patients, I think what dental schools do a poor job of is how do you teach somebody not to be a single tooth dentist? And when we're baby dentists, yeah, that's what we do. Okay, does this tooth have perio disease? Does it have uh, cracks in it where it needs a crown? Does it have decay? Does it have an abscess? No. Okay, check. Go to the next tooth. And that's traditionally how we're taught. But the reality is you've got 28 teeth in most cases. Um, you got two joints, nerves, muscles. You know, you can bend your, your right elbow and keep your left elbow straight. Well, you can't open the right side of your mouth and keep the, the left side shut. All of this has to open and close and function in synergy. And I think as dentists, we're not taught that. Now, go out, you buy a practice, whatever you learned in dental school, if you're not spending 10,000 or 50,000 or whatever it is a year to keep the education going with continuing ed, you are a fifth year dental student and you're moving through as best you can. And I think we can all cut crowns good. We can all, we can all extract a tooth. I mean, there's some basic remedial type stuff that we all are, are, are learning and we're proficient at when we come at dental schools, out of dental school. But the reality is um, dental schools are teaching to what the board exams are. And so for Christ's sake, you got people that are learning how to do gold foil still and polish amalgams and that's not really relevant to, to, to practicing today. And so if you really want to bring dentistry up a notch, teach it, make it a requirement that you have to know occlusion and you have to know how to treat these patients. And the dental schools won't do that until all of a sudden ADA credentialing says, hey, we're not going to credential your school until if 30% of the American population at some point in their life is going to have really bad TMD, we should be able to treat it. And there should be some sort of consensus. Now, this was done, I think it was last year, a couple of years ago. Uh, Charles Green wrote a paper and uh, was a firestorm. And so, and, and what he did was he said, okay, so what we should do is the, we should have a, uh, a guideline for how we treat and everybody should agree to it. Well, a lot of the half the docs that are, that are listening to this, if they read that paper, wouldn't agree with what he said. So where do you start? It's not about, you know, jumping into somebody else's dental office and say, Hey, I treat it better because I measure, or, you know, you're not up to par. Let's bring you up to par and you just need to take these courses. I mean, we, we would love it if it was that simple, but I think it really is more basic than that. So <clears throat> let's talk about your practice. So when, what percent of your practice is TMD? Oh, let's see. Well, I'd probably say about 75% of my practice is bread and butter dentistry. And, and there's probably 5% is cosmetic and about 15% is active TMD. And I'm, 
Um, some of those are neuromuscular cases because they're not candidate candidates for DTR. I say the overwhelming majority are candidates. I mean, I'd rather do a, a limited coronoplasty, um, but if a patient comes in with blown out flat teeth and there's nothing to really build anterior guidance with, maybe we need to do some reconstructive work. So um, as a percentage, let's see, I did 53 DTR cases last year and I did three full mouths. So, so, so walk us through a DTR case. Now, is it, um, is it going to be what we hear that, you know, 90% of TMD patients are women or is that, is, is that, you find that in your practice or not so much? Um, you know, I think it's the kind of the 80, 20 rule, about 80% of women, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 80% of the patients are female and about 20% are, are male. Men tend to blow up their teeth. I mean, when you look at, um, men and women, now there are certainly, there's some exceptions to the rule, but generally as a rule, um, women get symptoms and, and men just destroy teeth. So is there a hormonal balance? Uh, yeah, I think that there's something there that we don't have an answer to, but Certainly, men get migraines, get headaches, have neck pain. But, so, um, so, so you, you think estrogen or a hormone could play a factor in this? Oh, absolutely. And some people also say, you're a psychology major, some people say that um, women, women are just more likely um, to seek help and go to a doctor than a man. I mean, kind of like, think of your, your dad never asking for directions while your mom's over there having absolutely. a corner. I, I would agree with that. It's probably a, a big factor in it. Yeah. I mean, my dad used to drive my mom insane because he wouldn't stop at a gas station and ask for help. My dad just thought that was so beneath him to ask another human to where uh, where Disneyland is. So, so, so these patients walk in. Describe describe the the mean average median patient and and what you go through. You've mentioned technology. You said T scans. Can you walk us through a patient? Sure. So. Um... Well, what is a typical patient that comes in? Uh, God, I've had um, everybody from a 15-year-old young lady uh, who just got out of ortho, and her pain didn't start until the month after ortho came off, all the way to a uh, executive, Microsoft executive who drove down from Seattle um, uh, because he was having facial tension, facial pain, and saw some of the videos online. So spectrum um, about the only thing that I could tell you is that 80-20 rule is consistent, but it affects everybody. Um, as far as a, what is my typical protocol for TMD, the first thing I would do would be a consultation. And in that consultation, um, I use T-scan and I use uh, EMGs linked to it, to it. So I want to ascertain, is there a bite force discrepancy? And then I also want to look at the bite timing. Now, this is something that's not taught in dental school, the timing of the bite. Um, and that's huge because dis uh, disclusion time trumps bite force. So you can have somebody who is 60-40 right and left. Let's say if they're missing uh, a lower molar on the, uh, on the right side. Well, there's no way they're going to be 50-50 because they're missing a tooth. So there's going to be a bite force discrepancy. But the bite timing and, and the dis the time that it takes for teeth to come apart and together, you can measure using T-scan. So if a patient comes to me and says, look, doc, all my pain is on the right side. Um, my shoulder's tense, my neck's tense, my face hurts, hurts, my headaches are on the right side. And then I'll, and then I'll check with T-scan if there's a bite force discrepancy that says, okay, either they can't bring their teeth together on the right and they're having to really clench down for that to happen, or maybe they hit first. Now, articulating our paper and shim stock won't necessarily tell you anything about bite force. They surely won't tell you anything about timing of the bite, because that has to be measured by a computer. So, explain to the patient, tech scan is a very wonderful technology that's very visual, and patients get it. I mean, 15 minutes with it, and they understand what all those colors mean and the peaks and valleys and the right and left and how their bite comes together and they'll say oh my god yeah i told the dentist 15 times that that crown wasn't right and we can see it it's not right not only can we see that the, there's more force on it 
we can tell if it's in the front of the crown, the back of the crowns. Whereas if you're just relying on articulating paper, it's just a sea of blue. You can't really assign any bite force. And if you're thinking that, well, if the if it's a if it's darker than the rest of them, or if it's a wider surface area, that means that that tooth is hitting hard in that area. It's like no, the research says that that's not true. Um, okay, are you talking about the T scan made by Tech Scan in Boston, in, uh, Boston, Massachusetts? Sure. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Can can you you you've I'm not not to interrupt you, but you've mentioned a lot of things. Things I think a lot of these uh, uh, townies aren't going to understand. You've mentioned EMG, T scan. Um, can you talk about the T scan? Like, how much does it cost? How do they get one? Um, what does it actually sure. do? Can you can you go into more detail about that? Yeah, T scan is a digital occlusal analyzer, and if you can, if you can imagine. Um, a mylar strip that we use for class three um, cavities, it being in an arch shape and covered in over a thousand sensors. Okay, so that's what they're biting their teeth on. And this this um, technology, this mylar strip allows flexure so that it'll fit in between the teeth. And so you have a patient bite into, into MIP or CO and- What's MIP, what's CO? Yeah, uh, centric occlusion or maximum intercuspation. It's the same thing. Um, uh, different people probably know it by different, by slightly. Centric, occlu centric occlusion with CO, what was the other one, MI? Maximum intercuspation, MIP. Okay. Okay. Just basically bring your teeth together so that they all touch as evenly as you can, okay? And so what that'll do is it'll give you a movie that you can watch in real time from first tooth contact all the way through to maximum clinch all the way to when they release. So do they start their bite on the right side? Do they start their bite on number eight and number eight's all chipped and fractured? Or have you done a, a, a cervical composite cavity on number four and that thing just keeps popping out and you keep redoing it free? Well, what's the patient doing? You've done other, other fillings on this patient um, that aren't popping out and failing. Well, it could be that there's more force on that one tooth and the flexure of the tooth is causing that cervical erosion or that composite to pop out. How much is that T-scan and how accurate is it? Uh, good question. T-scan, you know, you'd, you'd have to contact the company. I think I paid 10,000 for a T-scan. Um, the sensors themselves, which you would use for each patient that would have their own or six bucks. Um, Does the information transfer into the computers, into the patient's chart or is it a separate uh, storage or? Yeah, yeah. So um, what I was trying to think of, what was the, what was the second question? Uh, how accurate is it? And, I'm sorry? And how accurate is it? Accuracy. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, a study that was done on accuracy. Um, Robert Kirstein did a study where he took an arch of a patient. It wasn't really even an arch. It was more like a quadrant. And it had uh, occlusal markings on it. And so he asked uh, over 200 dentists, I think it was either 285 or 255, um, to interpret those blue dots. And the dentists were from every background of, I don't do occlusion really, to I've done a lot of studying in occlusion. And the doctors were right, picking out the most forceful marking 13% of the time. Mm. 13. Now, T-scan is 97% accurate. And it's funny because even the papers that try to, to disprove its accuracy prove that it is accurate. There's an article coming out in Cranio, uh, um, uh, I, I want to say in January, and they have a, a machine that, that records, um, records force, and they took a sensor, and they had it go up and down on the sensor, and... Every time the machine went down, T-scan registered that the pressure went down. 
every time pressure went up, T-scan said that it went up. And there's this perfect correlation of up, down, parallel with the, the data of the original machine. So it works despite what anybody wants to say about it. It is a good piece of technology. Incidentally, the U.S. government uses that same technology when they're moving warheads, nuclear warheads. So it's precise, it's reliable, and it's accurate. So you use these, do you use it on just your uh, TMD patients? No. Um, I use it on, if I do, if I'm doing a single unit uh, crown, um, I'll, I'm probably pretty lazy. Uh, I'll get my centric stop. I'll have the patient go right and left, get rid of any excursive interferences from my crown, and then I'll seat it. Um, if I'm doing two single units or a three unit bridge, I'm, I'm bringing T-Scan out absolutely. Uh, in my office, the ladies just have it setting out for me, uh, especially if you're doing cosmetics or a long span bridge. Oh my gosh, what it, it's, so, it's happened so many times. I mean, even in my own hands, where I thought I could do it by hand, and all of a sudden, on the distal of number two, a distal abutment for a long span bridge or even a three unit bridge, you break off a little piece of porcelain. And so what do we do? Do we redo it? Do we tell the patient, hey, you know, the, the lab messed up, you know, we gotta do this over? Well, you've been using the lab that you've been using because it's a good lab. Really, what I think is going on is, you know, on the ones that break, I didn't check, I didn't check force, I didn't check pressure. And the ones that I do check, I don't have a problem with chipping and breaking. So all of a sudden you have to weigh, you know, $10,000, yeah, that's a lot of money. But your guys who are 30 years old, you know, 10000 amortized over how many years in their career, not to mention chair time. Do you, how much does it cost you to redo a three-unit bridge? How much does it cost you to replace an arch because the bite's not right? That's a lot of money in itself. You, and, I'll, you, and I'll tell you where it really saves time is in the, the reconstructive and the cosmetic. So um, I, inst I did an arch about a, uh, a month ago, and I called, um, I called T-Scan. I was so excited. I'm like, wow, I just put in an arch, made myself use T-Scan through the whole thing. And I had that for the first round of occlusal adjustments, 20 minutes. That's not very long. Well, actually, when I went back and looked at them, because all the scans are time stamped, it was 16 minutes. Now, how much those, how much money do you put on that value? You know, so I mean, if you're doing large restorative cases that's complex, it behooves you, I would think, to measure now. And I'll say this, I'm not, a, I'm not a spokesperson for any technology firm or company. Um, I'm not involved with any secondary education for any dentist or dental, dental company or materials company. So what I say is, is um, free and clear from any financial incentives. And I just, I just want to add that um, I actually am a spokesman for Calvin Klein. And one of their models. models? Yeah. So yeah. Well, this jacket I'm wearing was <laughs> was given to me free <clears throat> to build their brand. You also threw out the term EMG. What is an EMG? Sure. Um, electromyography. So much like a cardiologist will put leads on your chest to monitor electrical activity and cardiac muscle, um, I measure, and guys who use EMGs, measure electrical output in muscles of mastication, temporalis, the masseter, SCM, trapezius, uh, anterior belly of the digastrics. And so if, you're, if, you, if you can record a higher level of elect electrical output, that muscle's doing more work by definition, okay? So if you're monitoring, you know, cardiac, uh, cardiac measurements, and there's a lot of electrical activity, you're going to have a higher heart rate. That muscle is doing more weight, uh, more work. And the mus skeletal muscle in the face is no different. Um, 
And so it is a gauge by which we, you know, use to help us diagnose and, 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 and myofascial pain and, and, um, and TMD before we pull the trigger, so to speak. I want to go after a very, very common question that I see on Dental Town um, all the time, and I get emails for this. Uh, they're young, they're coming out of school, and they sit there and they say, um, what if I want to learn occlusion? So, so you, you've been doing occlusion for decades. They want to learn occlusion, and they say, well, I'm confused. I mean, I hear uh, Dawson has his own type of occlusion in school, and does Pinky have the same occlusion as Dawson? Um, I've heard LVI is neuromuscular. Um, I was wondering if you could do two things for me. If, if some 30-year-old kid's listening and says, well, I, I want to learn occlusion, can you explain the different camps of occlusion and where you would go to learn which camp and, and, and what camp would you recommend starting at? Because you said in the beginning that not every camp solves every problem and that nobody's 100%, but can you explain the different occlusion camps and where this 30-year-old podcast listener driving to work right now uh, could extend their study on occlusion? Sure. Um don't you like okay. the th- Don't you like the way I throw out about thirty eight questions for every question? Yeah, I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> so Panky Dawson Coy Spear, um, LVI, they they all have their own um, paradigm, if you will. So would you would you go just stop starting? Or would that be about the five camps? Panky Dawson Coy Spear LVI. I mean. Is that pretty much all the occlusal occlusion training camps in the United States? Uh, I wouldn't say it was all of them, but I would say you're hitting probably the big the big five there. That'd be the big five. Yeah. Would, would that be the eighty twenty rule? Would would those guys cover eighty percent of the occlusion camp training? Uh, yeah. You know, I'd throw another one in there. True Denta. Um, uh, True Denta, while it's not really an occlusal uh, uh, camp per se. They are measuring in between the teeth, and so I would give them a lot of credit. You know, um, I mean, my opinion for doing that. And that. Who, who, who? Where are they at, and who heads that up? Oh God, I'm not sure who heads that up. They're in Florida. Just, just Google True Denta. That is and, amazing. Panky's in Florida. Dawson's in Florida. True Denta's in Florida. What is it? Those old people down there. What are all those old? Yeah, people? maybe they have a load. Maybe they're eating uh, the, uh, crab shells, and they're not, uh, you know, taking the meat out of the crab before they eat it. I don't know what, what's going on down there, but um, I think a lot of that is is um, uh, marketing and where's a fun, nice place to go, you know, when you're doing your CE. But so, um, wow, it's tough to say. Looking back retrospectively on my career and my CE, what I've done, you know, maybe a, maybe a better res- response to the answer is here's what I did, and um, you guys can take it for what it's worth. Um, I got into when I started getting into TMD, somebody said, oh, whatever you do, don't go down to LVI, you know, those don't drink the Kool Aid, you know, whatever. And so that instantly piqued my curiosity. And I went there, and these guys were measuring muscle. They were taking scans. They had digital uh, equipment that was helping them treat complex restorative cases and pain patients. And so, wow, I'd never heard of this was even remotely possible. Uh, and so I went went through that camp. And But when I went through there and um, – now, LVI there, camp, that's neuromuscular? That's neuromuscular, LVI, yeah. Taught by Bill Dickerson? Yeah. Um, I had really, really good results. But, and they teach, they, they teach a coronoplasty course there, as all of them do, but no one's measuring in between the teeth. And so... A buddy of mine, Mark Montgomery, who's taught at Pack Live, and uh, he's at True, De- True Dental now as their their main dental guy. He said, "Well, you got to check out this technology and start measuring in between the teeth." And so I took that course, and he's right. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be learned by measuring in between the teeth that a K7 or uh, bio research type of modules will not give you. And then um, I kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be 
neat to put the EMGs on and be able to see what's going, what's going on with the bite and T-scan in real time. And that's when I met uh, Robert Kirstein and started reading some of his work. And um, I started going down the DTR path because what was happening for me is I was seeing Nick Yanos and Kirstein. They were doing the same thing that I could do, but they were doing it a lot faster. So they were getting results in like 45 minutes to an hour. Well, I wasn't even through taking my impression, and I had two weeks to wait before the lab would bring me back an orthotic. And, and their patients are already starting to see results. So I'm missing something. And so you start linking the EMGs to the bite and you start seeing more stuff. Um, but I think for me, the CR-based um, occlusal paradigms, when you start manipulating the jaw in a superior, and, and, and a part of the dentist say it's posterior, part of the dentist say it's uh, anterior superior. Uh, well, it moves every 10 years. Well, yeah. I mean, there's like seven <laughs> definitions uh, in the glossary of prosthodontic terms. So, I mean, pick one. I think now the flavor of the, of the, the decade is it's superior anterior uh, position. But 99% of the work done in the country is done at MIP. That's where DTR is. And so the neuromuscular guys, LVI and, um, and the bio research guys will say, well, when I move the jaw down and forward, I see EMGs go down. And that's true. That happens. You can measure that. And when we do DTR, the jaw comes down and forward all by itself. So I have a problem with bilateral manipulation and bringing the jaw back, whether it's back superior, uh, superior forward, you know, you're starting to do occlusal adjustments in a position that may be diagnostic, but it's not physiologic, um, at least with the, the, the stuff that I measure with. So I try to do the DTR at MIP and let the jaw just kind of go wherever it wants to go as part of the natural healing process. And it's conservative. Uh, you know, some guys I know are listening to this and saying, but you're adjusting enamel. Yes, I do adjust enamel. I'm adjusting the enamel that every book on occlusion says is wrong. It's interferences. I'm not touching centric stops. We're not closing people down. We're removing the stuff that Dawson and Jankelson and Ash and Daniels and these guys who wrote these books say is problematic. But you kind of, equilibration is different than DTR and DTR to do it, you have to be able to measure disclusion time and you have to have technology to do that. You cannot just rely on, let me move the jaw around and I'm going to put some bite paper in here and we're going to start adjusting these slides. I can't tell you, I've got, well, I'm getting off on a tangent. <laughs> let me get back to your original question. What I would do is I would find, a, a get, get a tech scan um, demo in your office. And what I would do is I would do a lunch and learn, which is what I did, have some doctors over. I had a prosthodontist come. I had a, an orthodontist come. I had a pedodontist come. And we just looked at doctor's bites, and we didn't even adjust them. And you could see the gears turning in these doctors' head while the um, while the tech scan was doing their 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 demo. And you'll find Howard that when you measure objective, because I don't belong to any camp. Now, yeah, I've got a couple of accolades, and I've done a couple of you know courses, and you know this one and that one. But I measure every single time. And what you're going to find when you do that is some tenets and pillars of occlusal therapy that the profession has held on to, they don't have any weight. Like, for example, I'll give you one. Non-working interferences are part of the problem. Or a major component as far as TMD is concerned. It's not. It's working interferences. It's 180 degrees 
from what was first published. And so some of us are still holding on to, well, it's in a book and this is what I'm holding on to. But when you, actually, when you can actually measure it on every single patient and you see a right lateral excursive movement, they're in group function and not an anterior guidance where those posterior teeth come apart, they're gonna, not everybody's gonna have pain, but the patients that are symptomatic usually have that one thing in common, muscle hyperactivity due to working side group function. So some of the old, the old books still say, we, we really wanna have anterior guided, immediate posterior disclusion, but working side group function's okay. Man, it is not okay. <laughs> okay, but Ben, what are the uh, what what in your opinion are the ten thousand six hundred orthodontists in America doing to all these kids? I mean, we run all of our kids to an orthodontic tooth mill. What what are they doing to it? What what, are you, what is your thoughts of uh, before and after um, occlusion after the uh, they all go through the ten thousand orthodontists? Well, you know, let's let's speak frankly here. A, uh, an ortho consult, they take a pano, they may take a 3D beam, they take an SF, they are measuring skeletally, they're not measuring occlusion. Yeah, yeah, wait, 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 we do measure occlusion. Yeah, okay, angles class one, angles class two, angles class three. How many orthodontists are measuring bite force and disclusion time? Bite timing, very few. And so when I talk to, and, and I'm not going to beat up on orthodontists too much here because um, my daughter is in an or, in interceptive ortho now. I mean, we need ortho. We do. Um, but I have a, I guess, a philosophical problem with specialists moving teeth around somebody's skull and then say, well, we really don't do too much occlusal adjustment. We let the general dentist do that. Really? The, the guys with the bite paper? If you are taking on moving teeth around in someone's skull, it's your responsibility. I mean, can you imagine a prosthodontist saying, I'm going to do full mouth rehab on this patient. I'm going to put all the porcelain in. I'm going to send the patient back to the general dentist, and he's going to get the bite right. No. No one would ever re send any referrals to that ortho, I mean, to that prosthodontist, but somehow it's okay in ortho. And so, incidentally, I will say that my, my go-to guy in my area says 90% of adults would benefit from some sort of coronaplasty. I think that's a fair statement. Now, not everybody needs it. Not everybody's symptomatic. But what are they doing? What are the orthodontists doing? Um before and after to the Curva Speed, the Curva Wilson, and, and, and particularly canine guidance that you're talking about. I mean, when kids go into the orthodontist with crooked teeth and canine guidance, do they come out with straight teeth and canine guidance? Some of them do. Some of them don't. You know, I mean, straight teeth does not a good bite make. So, you know, who's measuring what? I, I've, got, I've got a couple of guys who... Very interesting. Um, I did T-scan on them before ortho. I did a T-scan on them the day before they're debanded. And when you start talking in terms of bite force and timing, these cases, while the teeth are beautifully straight, they're horrific in terms of occlusion. Not m macro occlusion, but I'm talking micro occlusion. You know, how the teeth all interdigitate. And when you look from side to side, you can only see things on the cheek side. All right, so what do we, how do we view all the lingual cusps? Well, okay, you can scan it. You can take models. and and But are all orthodontists even doing that before they deband uh, their patients? And then the rebound, it's interesting to watch. You know, there's some orthodontic settling because of the ligaments that hold the teeth into bone. And we want the... Um, the, the retainers and the wires to be uh, bonded in place so the sexy social six in the front don't start having these rotations and twists and turns. Well, if you're measuring the occlusion, 
I would submit to you that it's really a bite force imbalance and these teeth are twisting and rotating a little bit to make room so they interdigitate better on their own. Hey Ben, I want I want to throw some uh I want to throw some tough questions at you that I know these kids ask cuz I hear them ask them, I see them ask them on Dental Town. One of the first things uh, kids say is, "Come on, Ben, when you eat your teeth don't even touch. You just chew the food. Your teeth aren't touching, so none of this matters." What do you say to that? Yeah, I've got some uh, videos I'll post where I tell my, my pain patients the exact same thing, where doctors are going to tell you that what I did has absolutely nothing to do with your pain level and your threshold and you feeling better. And this is all pseudoscience. And when you take a patient who's been suffering for 40 years, Howard, and all of a sudden you get the, the not the envelope of motion, but the envelope of function, correct? Their pain goes away. They'll look at you and say, whoever is publishing that the way teeth come together is not important to how I feel, missed the boat. So, you know, yeah, and, and, and it's funny. I would ask, I got a question for all the people who say, look, the teeth don't come together. It's not about teeth coming together. So what you're saying by definition is you can put any piece of acrylic in that person's mouth and you never have to do a post-insertion adjustment to that appliance. If it's all about separating the teeth, who cares how the teeth are touching? It's not about the teeth touching. Ben, how could we get a – we put up, uh, you know, the – Continuing education has been migrating from uh, the classroom to online as fast as the you know University of Phoenix online has been growing. We put up 350 courses on Dentaltown. They've been viewed over half a million times. I, I, I would give anything for you to put a course on Dentaltown. Is there any way we could get you to do that? Yeah, I would do it. I, th I think a lot of people are going to be shocked, uh, and I think you guys might be getting hate mail that I'm a heretic, but – um, what I do and what would be really interesting is to film it in my office and let's go over a couple of cases. Let's not just do one. Let's do like three in a day and let's take the measurements before and after we do one round of DTR, just one round, not even, I usually do three because as the, um, as the muscles relax, the jaw comes slightly down and forward, and the bite has to be fine-tuned and refined a little bit. But a lot of times, you'll see joint vibration analysis where a, a Piper 3A goes to a Piper 1. Well, what does that mean? What did I just say? What are those words? And, and most of the guys listening to this aren't going to know what that means. But basically, the simple thing is occlusal adjustments of noxious stimulus meaning working interferences and trying to get that anterior guidance going, changed not only physiologic response, but changed the stru structure of how the disc sits in the joint. That's something that you can measure with joint vibration. So it's, it's, a, it's a different world when you start bringing in diagnostic um, equipment and measuring. And I'd be happy to do that. One of the, I think one of the challenging parts to doing that is having a camera that will sit on the teeth because unlike showing a perio surgery or unlike showing um, a implant surgery where you're looking at a whole quadrant, I'm looking at a couple of teeth at a time with blue dots on them. So your magnification is going to have to be, I mean, I, I, that problem I can't solve, but to really see what I'm doing, um, um, you're going to have to be able to show that in addition to uh, how, you know, how the patient feels and what the results of the diagnostics are. I want to throw another uh, hard-hitting question at you. There's a lot of dentists now saying that um, all this occlusion stuff is really sleep apnea and that the reason they're grinding and having TMD and all this stuff like that is because they have sleep apnea. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, no. Um, I wouldn't say that. I would say that there is a very real 
component with obstructive sleep apnea and TMD, absolutely. But no, I mean, I have sleep apnea. I'm asymptomatic. I don't have any wear facets. So again, uh, maybe it's the 50-50 rule, the 80-20 rule. Um, I think what they're alluding to is there was um, uh, some research done where uh, anybody that's had a PSG done or a polysomnogram, a sleep study, they hook you up with all these wires and they're monitoring the, the heart, they're monitoring the brain. They're, they're, they can monitor anything, uh, including facial muscles. And when people stop breathing, they can clench almost 300% more than when they're awake. So, um, you know, anybody who treats TMD should be including an Epworth sleep scale uh, along with it because I've gotten bit before I started to do that as a matter of habit where um, you're treating TMD, the patient doesn't get better, and then all of a sudden you turn around, the guy's asleep in your chair, and you ask him a question, and he's out. Hey, you have daytime sleepiness a lot? We should go and um, uh, have that checked out with a sleep study. He starts breathing better, and then all of a sudden his pain's gone. So, you know, anybody who's doing TMD work should include a sleep study, absolutely. But I don't think there's a cause-effect relationship. So you don't think the sleep apnea causes TMD? You think no. they are? I think it'll exacerbate it if there's a problem there. Absolutely. So it'll just make it worse. I think it'll make it worse. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I only got you for four more minutes, but I get this question a lot. And I'm sorry to be oversimplified, but they, they keep saying, what exactly is neuromuscular dentistry? What, what is that? Well, I think... Neuromuscular dentistry, you're, you're, you're concerned about, there's some differentiation between, okay, we're concerned about how the nerves and the muscles and the teeth all work together. And I think that there's a lot of people listening to this will say, well, hey, I'm a CR doc and I have all the same equipment as this guy does. And that may be true, but I think when the, when the Barney Jankelson when he first started building his, um, you know, some of his equipment and his uh, myo monitor for tensing, you know, people thought he was crazy, but he would hell he was me he was measuring things, and so he had to call it something. And so, um, you know, there's a CR based camp. His was totally different. Um, but I think dentistry as a whole, people who do this work there are neuromuscular components, which I think if you don't know, um, you're, you're a mouse fighting a gorilla. And so it's interesting, you know, I went to, uh, in 2010, I got my fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry and I, I had to go to, um, um, to New Orleans to the, 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 the annual convention. And there I heard some CR guys talk and I had heard a lot of neuromuscular guys talk and it, what's funny to me is both paradigms cite the same literature saying, see, we're right, told you. But they're totally different. They're totally different schools of thought. So, um, you know, I don't, have a, I don't have an easy answer there for you either, unfortunately. You know, I'll tell you what, I'm a big fan of your YouTube videos. How many YouTube videos do you have? Well, I, I've only got nine videos out there. I think the that's one a that's lot. got the that's that's nine more than ninety nine percent of all the dentists in the world. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. but uh, Nick Yanos has got like ninety case studies. Uh, videos Nick Yanos, how, how do you spell his name? Nick what? Yanos. Um, y i a n n o i s. If you go to my YouTube videos, his are going to be sprinkled in on the on the right hand column. Because uh, they're all DTR tagged, but um, they are pretty amazing, and I, I, I don't put all of them up because I'm too busy doing the work, uh, and it takes it's a huge time sink to build those videos. But I have uh, I have a couple more that I'm going to be putting up in the next couple of months here, and just the the response. Now, are, are you putting them up for dentists or for patients? No, I'm putting them up for patients. Um, you know, my frustration has been that I think medicine and dentistry for quite a long time has failed 
a lot of these chronic pain patients. And so when you see my YouTube videos, you're going to see something on there that says Meniere's disease. Well, what is that? And how is Sutter able, as a dentist, how is he able to make these people feel better? When we have to get down to the physiology, you have to measure something. And so a lot of these diagnoses are really done verbally. We listen to what patients say, hey, these are my chief complaints. Can you help me, doc? And then we somehow have to build a vocabulary. Okay, well, is the, is the pain stabbing or lancing or electric? And based on some of those, that language, we come up with a diagnosis. I mean, read uh, Weldon Bell's oral facial pain. It's ridiculous. A lot, I, my contention is that a lot of this is TMD that's misdiagnosed. Otherwise, there's no reason why a TMD therapy would make these patients feel better. So you kind of opened up so many, uh, so many questions in your podcast and we're, uh, um, we hit, we're overtime. Uh, we're into overtime. We are, the hour is gone. Um, can our listeners, you're talking to several thousand dentists. Do you think our, someday you could, uh, put a course up on dental tone? Yeah, I would be happy to do that. Um, it'd, it'd be an honor, buddy. Yeah, I would absolutely want to do that. Or you know what? If, uh, if the guys listening to this would like an article published in Dentaltown on DTR and occlusion, I can do that too. Uh, absolutely. Um, email it. I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com. And there's two Howards. Um, the person in charge of the online CE is Howard Goldstein. So his email is Hogo for Howard Goldstein, H O G O at Dentaltown.com. I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com. And by the way, any of our listeners, if you want a special guest, a special topic or whatever, uh, send me an email where he sends that. But uh, Ben, seriously, dude, I know you're a busy, busy man. Uh, you, uh, I'm a big fan of you. I've watched all your YouTube videos. Uh, you're a big fan of my friends. And the reason I went after uh, you is because um, I, I actually think TMJ, TMD, occlusion, coy, salvii, true down. I, I think that might be the most uh, – controversial part of all of dentistry. I think more people agree on how to do a root canal or a crown prep <laughs> than how to treat oral facial pain. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. Yeah, so thanks for having the kahunas uh, to state your views at a society, at, at a dental society that likes to argue about this until midnight every night. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm I'm sure my email is going to uh, be busy over the next couple of well, weeks. What, well, do you mind giving them your email? I mean, what, what if a dentist has a question for you? Um, sure. My email is basdmd at gmail.com. So uh, BAS for Ben A. Sutter, yep. DMD at gmail.com. What's the – what's the um, – What's A stand for? Adam? Adam? Arvey. Arvey. Huh. Yeah. That, you know. Uh, Family don't name? E don't even ask, man. <laughs> hey, it beats, uh, beats being named Howard uh, when I was a kid. Who were the old Howards? Howard the Coward and Howard Cosell. So uh, I probably got teased on the playground uh, as much. But, hey, Ben, seriously, dude, thank you so much for an hour of your life. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners do, too. And uh, I hope to see you on the message boards and uh, I hope to see your online CE course someday.